topic, the main subject of my book, and then move to a few uh, subtopics that I hope might be of particular interest to the audience, uh, namely references as an arbiter of federalism. That's very much for Professor Wright. Uh, the, and then just some comments about the core tension that they represent, which is captured in the final two chapters of my book, uh, which I have called um, Actors of Vice and Law, and then finally the, the advisory court. So I hope to talk for around 35 minutes. I'm definitely going to put a hard cap on that so that there can be some time for questions. Uh, and I'm very happy to, to have questions uh, or comments. So if you were to approach a number of people and ask them what do courts do, I think many of the answers somehow would incorporate the idea, courts decide cases. It might be expressed in different words, such as courts settle conflict, courts give judgment, courts adjudicate disputes, courts vindicate wrongdoing, but at the root of the answer would lie this recognition of the idea, courts decide cases. And the reason you would tend to get an answer like that is that deciding cases is precisely what our courts tend to do most of the time. And indeed, it is what most courts in Anglo-American systems tend to do almost all of the time. Canada, though, has allocated a separate and additional function to its courts, the ability to issue opinions without a case, in the absence of a live dispute. They've done this since 1875, and these proceedings, which are initiated by the executive branch, produce what we call reference or advisory opinions. Advisory opinions have presented some of the most controversial and important disputes that Canada has confronted since Confederation in such topics as patriation of the Constitution, same-sex marriage, Quebec secession, Senate reform, the gun registry, assisted human reproduction, and the ill-fated nomination of a Supreme Court judge. These were all tremendously significant constitutional moments, but as a distinct phenomenon, as an event in and of themselves, references have been somewhat oddly underexplored by legal scholars. And so this was always something that struck me as intriguing, and so in April of 2019, I published the first full-length legal treatment of the reference power in Canada, my book, Courts Without Cases, The Law and Politics of Advisory Opinions. So as I just stated, advisory opinions have been a distinguishing feature of the Canadian legal system. The US Constitution, by contrast, states that the federal judiciary shall decide cases and controversies. And as a result, it's long been accepted that it, it's inappropriate for federal courts to issue advisory opinions, and indeed, they don't do so. Now, there are some state constitutions which permit state courts to issue advisory opinions, but even then, they tend to do so extremely rarely, and advisory opinions simply have not been part of the American jurisprudential project. The advisory opinion function in Canada was modeled on a British statute, the Judicial Committee Act of 1833, which formally created as a court the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. Section 4 is the operative section that really seemed to have been transported to Canada. With respect to the Judicial Committee, Section 4 actually operates to this day, but almost exclusively with respect to former colonies of Britain. It is extremely rare to have Section 4 apply in a domestic British case. There was an example a few years ago, not exactly groundbreaking. The proceeding was called in the matter of the baronetcy of Pringle of Stitchell. And the question concerned whether apparent historical illegitimacy should displace a presumed baronet from his title in favor of a rival claimant. So not exactly Brexit-level litigation in these British advisory opinions. 
Interestingly, the impetus for Section 4 itself in this UK statute, the Judicial Committee Act, is not that well sourced. There's been relatively little discussion of it in the British context. But it's safe to say that the power was a natural outgrowth of the advisory function exercised by the former King's Council, or Curia Regis. One of the most important moments in the history of the advisory function in Canada was the opinion in re-references by the Government Council, which somewhat delightfully we call the reference re-references. And in that case, in that opinion, I should say, the Judicial Committee dismissed a provincial argument that the reference function was incompatible with the role of a court. So the provinces, uh, six of them, argued before the Judicial Committee that the reference function that the Supreme Court of Canada was authorized to exert actually was incompatible with its function as a general court of appeal. And the Judicial Committee dismissed that argument, noting that the power was well established, even if it hadn't been frequently used in Britain. It also noted that numerous references had already been appealed to the Privy Council in the Canadian context. And it finally put to the provinces the fact that they themselves had authorized their own courts of appeal to hear advisory opinions. So, Canadian courts, under the auspices of this Judicial Committee decision, quickly accepted the reference function as part of their duties. And indeed, until 1986, references accounted for one quarter of the Supreme Court's constitutional docket which really is an extraordinary proportion. Now, the assertion that was made very early on, 1912, that Canadian courts were perfectly situated to exercise an advisory function didn't explain precisely what it is that reference opinions would do. In particular, didn't explain how they would coexist with the appeals in ordinary cases that these courts would also be producing. And that's what's interesting about the Canadian example, that you have a court of otherwise general appeal that also performs this advisory function. So in civilian systems, in European systems, there is an entirely separate court, a constitutional court as it, as it is called, that performs the advisory function. Uh, generally, to have one court performing both of those functions is less common. You do see it in a few other systems, but certainly not in the Anglo-American one. In the reference recriminal code, also an early case, the court stressed, well, our advice has no legal effect. It doesn't affect the rights of parties. It doesn't affect other provincial decisions. They're not even binding upon us. And indeed, it was said to be unthinkable that the court would consider itself bound by its reference opinions. Well, it didn't take long for the unthinkable to occur. Uh, one scholar has said that the Supreme Court very quickly, even by 1930, 1940, tended to follow their own reference opinions with, and I love this term, undiscriminating zeal. And I'm going to talk, in, in, at the end of this talk, I want to offer some suggestions as to why that might have been um, the case. To move, though, to the next subtopic, advisory opinions quickly came to be viewed as a way of doing the business of federalism. The courts assumed the position of being an interpreter that could properly fill in gaps in existing constitutional text, and federalism itself assumed a more fundamental character, not just a pragmatic decision by separate political units to form a greater whole, but a process of nation building. And in that context, advisory opinions were not seen as a departure from the business of federalism, but an essential component of it. And in the book, in chapter five, I discuss a number of classic federalism disputes and show how the advisory function was central to them. Uh, and we have seen in recent years how central it is as well to current disputes that squarely raise important division of powers issues. 
One that is ongoing and in which we, in fact, received some more guidance yesterday is the reference concerning the validity of the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act, or the carbon tax reference. So the Pollution Pricing Act mandates a national fuel charge and it imposes it in provinces that do not have sufficient GHG reduction measures of their own. And from the start, a number of provinces, including Saskatchewan, Ontario, and Alberta, objected that the law was simply federal overreach. And so to press these concerns, Saskatchewan initiated a reference in its Provincial Court of Appeal asking the court to provide its opinion as to whether the federal law was in fact intravirous parliament. Ontario shortly thereafter initiated a similar challenge, as did Alberta some months later. Manitoba and New Brunswick were considering launching their own references. Ultimately, they decided not to. And the Saskatchewan reference in particular will now be heard by the Supreme Court of Canada at the end of March. The GGPPA reference is the first opportunity in many years to think about how the Constitution enables us to deal with environmental concerns, which is obviously an urgent issue. Indeed, the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal, in its opinion, called climate change one of the great existential issues of our time. And none of the parties before the court questioned that. Obviously, the question is how to deal with it. Now, the federal parliament enjoys a number of powers under the uh, Constitution Act 1867, such as over criminal law or taxation that could be wielded against climate change. Interestingly, the federal government has not relied on those more established powers in this case. It does offer an alternative reading of the fuel charge as a valid federal tax. But Strikingly, it has taken a much more difficult path. It is defending the carbon pricing law under the Constitution's peace, order, and good government power that it possesses, known, of course, as POG. And specifically, it invokes the national concern branch of POG in this vein. Even a year ago, I would have uh, characterized this strategy as the classic Hail Mary pass. It's very, very difficult to convince the Supreme Court to accept a new head of power under the National Concern Branch of POG. This is because to recognize anything under POG, but particularly the National Concern Branch, is always thought to bring with it the risk of swamping provincial powers. But it must be said that the federal government prevailed in both the, in both uh, Saskatchewan and Ontario in succeeding a majority in in persuading a majority of those judges that the law in fact could be sustained as an incidence of national concern. So the carbon pricing reference and the suite of decisions taken by the various provinces actually demonstrates several advantages of the reference function. One of those is that the moving government can frame the question exactly as it likes. There is a much speedier progression through the courts. Uh, the federal government can refer a matter directly to the Supreme Court. It is the only uh, body that can do so. But the provinces enjoy an automatic right of appeal for references that emanate from their provincial courts of appeal. References also enable provincial coordination, which is clearly in evidence here to launch multiple proceedings, to adjust tactics along the way, and to, in essence, respond to what various courts appear to be persuaded by, and equally unpersuaded by, in the various proceedings. They also increase the odds of finding judicial support, and we saw that yesterday with the Alberta Court of Appeal breaking ranks from Ontario and Saskatchewan and ruling four to one, or advising, I should say, four to one, that the law, in fact, is unconstitutional. And by appearing in these multiple proceedings, the parties, either the moving party, the intervening attorneys general, and the various interveners, the third party interveners, can sharpen and test their arguments before they ultimately arrive before the Supreme Court. 
Additionally, because references do not involve a live dispute between named litigants, the court may well consider itself to have more latitude to accept different arguments and indeed even to accept an expansion of the record. So in the Saskatchewan reference, the majority largely adopted a particular approach to POG that was not being offered by the Attorney General of Canada, but the Attorney General of British Columbia. And indeed, in the hearing, the Attorney General of Canada, seeing the way the wind was blowing, immediately endorsed the position of the uh, Attorney General of BC. The court may also decline to answer a question or interpret it in an unexpected way. So in the Saskatchewan case, because Saskatchewan focused its questions on the law's validity, the court declined to consider the separate issue of whether the fuel charge, even if valid, could be applied to provincial crown corporations. Another province could very well put that issue to its own court and have that go up to the Supreme Court. We also saw in the Alberta case that the Alberta government slightly tweaked its arguments to refer to the effect of a national concern argument on the a national concern application on the provincial power to control its own natural resources. And that had a great deal of force uh, with the majority of the Alberta Court of Appeal. So pursuing reference opinions in numerous provincial courts may appear duplicative, but they can be helpful. The Supreme Court, it should be pointed out, is not bound to follow the lower court's opinions, of course, but it may wish to consider, particularly in a matter such as this one, how different regional perspectives might usefully filter into its own judicial analysis. And the various opinions create a richer body of jurisprudence. It may also help to displace tension by allowing the issue to percolate in various jurisdictions for a longer period of time. So I do have some comments that I can make about the TMX, um, uh, the pipeline reference that the province of British Columbia roundly lost last month. But in the interest of time, I'm going to push ahead, but I'm happy to come back to that. Uh, in questions, and I know that's something on which uh, Professor Wright has a particular interest. Let me turn, though, now to the final two chapters of my book, where I examine, well, how do advisory opinions fit into the broader picture of law and jurisprudence? This was the core of the interest um, of this subject to me, and I often joke that I had to write 200 pages before I could get to the chapters I really cared about, um, I should point out that it was extremely necessary for me to write those eight chapters. But the reason that I was so intrigued by advisory opinions is because of the tension that they present. And that tension is the asymmetry between their formal and practical status. As many of you may have heard in, in previous uh, classes and lectures, References have no technical binding effect. They're advisory, literally. They do not invoke the court's formal remedial powers. That's the technical status. But the real world practical status <coughs> is very different. In fact, they seem to exert exactly the same force to comply, to obey, to accept them as generating legal rules as cases do. And in the final two chapters of my book, I explore and I offer some uh, analysis as to why this is the case. And chapter nine deals with non-judicial actors and how they view references, and chapter 10 turns from them to the courts themselves. So for non-judicial actors, I frame this as three questions. Why pursue? Why not comply? I'll come to that in a minute. And then finally, why comply? So why would you pursue a reference? Well, I group the reasons in four categories. Doctrinal guidance, coordination, strategy, and imprimatur. Doctrinal guidance is the most self-evident reason to pursue a reference, right? Where you have a problem of some legal dimension and it's creating some uncertainty or tension among important political groups, a state actor will look for ways to resolve it. 
Sometimes actors will actually avoid resolving this problem because it's strategically advantageous to them to, to not do so. You know, you might think of this as almost a policy-oriented willful blindness. But more often, and certainly over the history of the advisory function in Canada, actors seek answers. And most references discussed in my book have involved, to some degree, this pursuit of doctrinal guidance. So, for example, in the post-charter period, post-1982, references pertaining to criminal law, like the motor vehicle reference, which looked at the new demands presented by Section 7 of the Charter to seek clarity about the nature of criminal fault, or the prostitution reference, where the court had to determine whether long-standing prohibitions on aspects of the sex trade were constitutionally valid. The, this is a clear, uh, a clear attempt to seek that kind of guidance from the court. Additionally, an issue may be su sufficiently controversial that other actors will not take any steps in the direction of resolving that issue without some kind of judicial guidance. <coughs> And I would say that uh, arguably the 2014 reference on Senate reform is an example. The vast majority of provinces were very reluctant to enter into formal negotiations with the ultimate view of amending the composition, the role, the function of the upper house. The prime minister sought to avoid the more stringent routes to amendment, that is, i.e. Uh, involving formal um, provincial federal cooperation under the uh, amending formula, and to seek whatever changes he could by ordinary legislative or executive decision entirely within his control. But he wanted judicial input. Now, admittedly, the federal government was also dealing with a provincially initiated reference in the lower courts, but very likely it would have turned to the Supreme Court anyway. Moving to coordination, the initiation of a reference may relate to the idea that one has to organize in a coherent way social aims and projects. Again, just to minimize risk or uncertainty. And this is a particularly important issue in a federal state with multiple jurisdictions that might uh, lead to multiple sites of litigation. For example, the Anti-Inflation Act of 1976 involved extraordinary federal measures to impose, impose wage and price controls over which litigation was inevitable. And with respect to that act, which was a, a, an urgent priority for the federal government, it was able to obtain an opinion about the law's validity from the Supreme Court in nine months, which is just an impossibly brief time for ordinary litigation to win through all the levels of court and finally receive a definitive answer from the Supreme Court. An actor might also want to frustrate coordination. It may try to avoid a situation in which other actors build their own practices and policies around the decisions of another government, treating that government's choices as a fait accompli. So the actor could wish to discourage this sense that a particular policy or leg legislation is something around which everyone else should coalesce. Arguably, you could see the carbon tax references as a way to frustrate the coordination or the sense that the previous national consensus that was brief but was there around uh, how to deal with GHD emissions was really something that should have um, wide or <coughs> long-standing purchase. A number of reasons are strategic. Uh, they include what I call preemption, displacement, positioning, avoidance, and control. I'll just talk a little bit about control. Control is a particular um, feature of advisory opinions because of the very broad scope that is afforded to the initiating actor because invariably the statutes that afford the court its ability to answer reference questions really gives the executive the ability to ask, quote unquote, any question. Positioning refers to the actor's ability to use a reference to signal certain messages that may exist independently of its desire to secure a particular answer. And again, I think some of the current environmental references really clearly seek to engage in this kind of public message positioning. 
And the final reason to pursue is what I call imprimatur, which rests on the idea that having the court weigh in has a value all its own. Through references, actors can trade on the legitimacy and power of the court, which they, to large degree, lack. Why not comply? What do I mean by this? The fact is that Canadian political actors treat reference opinions as applying to them as something that should modify their behavior, and they respond accordingly. They do this even where the opinion completely contradicts prior case law, where they, the actors, have displayed, at best, modest regard for the court, and where they and others may regard the opinion as essentially wrong, totally misguided. And this attitude is striking, given the factors that would seem to argue against it, to provide them reasons to not comply, or at least to not readily comply. And so in this section, what I'm talking about is the fact that the actors who launch references have significant legal and political authority of their own. And so compared to an individual facing the power of a court judgment, they have more room to respond. And so you might think, at least over time, we would see some resistance, some reluctance, to accept any opinion that emerges as one that would compel the actor to comply. But they don't. They don't have that effect. They are treated, the, ref, the advisory opinions that the court issues are treated by political actors as containing reasons for action, reasons for them to modify their behavior, exactly the same as decisions in live cases. Why is that? Why do, they, why do these political actors regard advisory opinions as not being merely mere advice? Why do they do that compared to, for example, how they treat other forms of advice, such as royal commission reports, right, which are often headed by judges, often have a quasi-judicial uh, structure, in, take steps to ensure that there is some adversariality in their proceedings, but these reports are issued, the commissions uh, release their findings to great fanfare, and they are at best inconsistently followed. Why is that? Is there anything meaningful that distinguishes an advisory opinion from a royal commission report? Well, in my book, I focus on two sets of answers. The first is that for political actors, it may be that advisory opinions just count as law in the way that cases do. They have many of the markers of authority that would make that an understandable conclusion. In addition, even if they don't count as law, well, even if we're not prepared to abandon that long-standing tenet of what the reference function is, there are other factors that exert force on these actors to treat them as if they were law. The first is the attitude of the courts themselves. So to not preempt, that's going to be the final point I'm going to talk about. But the second is, there's considerable pressure on these actors to, in fact, respect the advice that they themselves have, thought, have sought. Right? It would be strange, it would create risk for the actor to initiate a proceeding before a body that is generally considered authoritative, that routinely issues authoritative directives, that one has requested to produce something that looks very much like an authoritative directive, only to subsequently disregard it. Right? That would create the perception that the actor is trying to game the process, seeking imprimatur for purely transactional reasons, but unwilling to absorb the cost of a negative result. Right? So it would risk at least some reputational and probably political damage. It's also probably the case that the actor may treat a reference opinion as binding, as requiring that obedience, because they hold the institution that issues it in some regard. Right? And that regard for the courts is, of course, an important part of the rule of law. So it shouldn't be surprising if it would be difficult to really disaggregate, to distinguish that regard, that respect, based on whether a pronouncement from the court takes the form of a reference opinion versus a decision in 
inter partes litigation. And then finally, of course, there is a healthy degree of self interest here. The actor who declines to follow a reference opinion increases the likelihood that her rivals will as well, and overall risks damaging that regard and respect for the courts that in their own, in the actor's own estimation, is actually important to the overall stability and order of the legal system. The final chapter looks at the courts themselves. And one of the underlying themes of my book is whether there was an inevitability at work here that eventually would render references virtually indistinguishable from cases in terms of authority. Once you take into account a few things, one is the nature of the questions put to the court in references. While they are technically unlimited in scope, they have for the most part tended to be legal questions that draw on the court's expertise in its general appellate function. Once you take into account procedural decisions that look very mundane, but these decisions made early on in the Supreme Court's life that resulted in references being pursued in ways that were very similar to cases, requiring notice, expecting pleadings, having an argument, and most importantly, providing reasons, which actually was not initially part of the package with the reference function, and it quickly became evident that if you put a reference to the court and its answer is a single word, yes or no, that's not terribly useful. And in relatively short order, the Supreme Court Act was amended to require the court to provide reasons for its answer. And then the third point is the broader nature of constitutionalism that has evolved in Canada and its specific effect and choices around litigation. Once you take into account these um, both theoretical but also historical and sort of real world factors, it becomes less surprising that the distinction between live cases and controversies, to borrow the American term, and so-called abstract review, which is how many jurisdictions regard an advisory function, and they do so disapprovingly, why that distinction will become much more tenuous. So let me unpack that a little bit in my um, remaining time by focusing particularly on stare decisis. Advisory opinions are now such a common accepted part of the structure, the body of Canadian precedent, that most people, including courts, don't distinguish between them in case law. They are treated as generating legal rules. And it is clear that when issuing references, the courts view themselves as engaging in rule-based reasoning, drawing on precedent, analogy, principle, and broader legal norms. I have numerous examples, but one that I want to just um, focus on is the same-sex marriage reference. So the same-sex marriage reference was a reference that the federal government put to the Supreme Court after it lost virtually all of um, the challenges it was defending against to the opposite sex definition of marriage, the common law, the common law definition, which was implicitly uh, reflected in the definition of marriage. A number of appellate courts ruled that that definition was contrary to the Charter, but instead of simply appealing those decisions to the Supreme Court, the federal government decided instead to draft for the first time a federal statute that would define capacity to marry and to refer that draft legislation to the Supreme Court. When it did so, all of the questions, there were three of them, they related to either division of powers questions or the interrelation between um, uh, equality rights and religious freedom rights, for example, of officiants. They did not actually put to the court the core issue in the same-sex marriage debate is the opposite sex definition of marriage contrary to Section 15 of the Charter. It was only after significant pressure was put on the federal government that they added question four. Is the opposite sex requirement for marriage for civil purposes consistent with the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms? They clearly did not want to put this um, issue before the Supreme Court. They declined to take an issue on it in the Supreme Court. 
And in somewhat of a returning of the favor, the Supreme Court declined to give an answer. Citing a unique set of circumstances, the Supreme Court refused to answer question four. It basically cited a number of reasons, including the government had indicated it was planning to pass the Civil Marriage Act anyway. It also noted that because the federal government had not appealed the provincial appellate decisions, those decisions had resulted in final judgments, and parties had, in fact, not married and therefore, in the court's view, had acquired vested rights. But the final reason the court gave, in my opinion, is the most salient. The court was concerned about any confusion, in its words, that would result if it answered question four differently from the way the lower courts had. If it answered question four to say that actually the charter doesn't require marriage to be gender neutral. While the reference opinion would not affect the law in the provinces where final judgments had, had issued, that answer would create an anomaly. Why would there be such an anomaly? If a reference is merely advisory, its answer is one of many, such as those found in treatises or scholarly work or foreign judgments, that can be considered and discarded. The point about the, judge, the reference being an anomaly holds if an answer in a reference either is an authoritative statement of law or will, for all, it, it, for all practical effects, be treated as such. This is basically an admission that references are a special, are in fact um, precedent, are entitled to the regard of stare decisis. This is the best explanation of the supposed confusion, that lower courts would consider themselves bound to respect the answer given by the Supreme Court, even if they themselves had already issued a final answer to the same issue. The clearest way to get over this anomaly would be to recognize the fact that the answer did come from a reference. But the court recognized that that wouldn't solve the problem, because its advisory opinion, in effect, it doesn't, it doesn't explain explicitly say this, but this is clearly the undercurrent of, of, its, of its explanation, its advisory opinion would be taken as an authoritative, authoritative statement of, of law. It would be taking a set, setting out the legal rule. We saw the same analysis in the Bedford decision of a few years ago dealing with prostitution. In that case, referencing the prostitution reference. In the Viancourt murder case, which considered the motor vehicle reference that I just I spoke about a bit earlier. And a trial decision, a criminal trial decision in Blackmore, which considered the BC Supreme Court decision or opinion in the polygamy reference. Finally, I want to conclude on another theme I developed in the book, which is the idea that the court's primary function is to provide answers to legal questions. Um, the expansion of the law of standing suggests that the court often considers the issue more important than the parties. And when it declares particular answers, that status has much the same effect as a formal declaration issued at the conclusion of, appeal, of an appeal. This is why even the supposedly strongest decision between references and cases, which is that there is no remedy that, that can apply in a reference, turns out to be somewhat unreliable. And um, I'll just, I, I, I need to conclude, but I just want to point out, and this is such a striking moment, in the, in the Supreme Court Act reference of 2014, when the court advised that Justice Mark Nadone was not eligible for the Supreme Court, it went further and said that his decision, his appointment had been void ab initio, and it went on further to clarify that he remained a judge of the Federal Court of Appeal. That is a remedy. And that is a remedy that was entered despite the fact that Justice Nadeau was not personally represented in the Supreme Court Act reference. And indeed, the original order in counsel appointing him to the Supreme Court has never been revoked. And that is why Justice Nadeau is famous for joking that he may, in fact, remain a member of the Supreme Court. And let me end by making a shameless plug for my forthcoming book <laughs> called The Tenth Justice, which includes some very interesting interviews with Justice Nadeau and other important actors in that very strange saga. There we go.
And let me end there, and thank you for your attention.